We're going to look at verse 9 on down and uh, continue through the Gospel of John. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. The Lord Jesus is saying to his the Lord Jesus is saying to his disciples, I have loved you as the Father has loved me. The Father's love for the Son is an incredible love. Is it not? It's an amount of love you and I cannot even comprehend. And yet, he says, I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Christ says, Jesus says, on that same level, have I loved you. Amazing set of words that he points towards his disciples and points towards all those that are his at this time and all those that will be his. All those that he will choose to be his. In his sovereign love and his sovereign choosing, if you will, those that will be his. He loves them, he keeps them, he protects them, he guides them. They rest in the sovereignty of their Lord, their God, the Savior of the world, their Savior. Their God. They rest in His love. The same level that the Father has loved Him. He says, I loved you even as the Father has loved me. Now remain in my, remain in my love. Remain in that love. Abide in my love. Abide in that love. If you keep my commandments you will be you will abide in my love just as I've kept my father's commandments and abiding in his love we looked a little bit of this last week to abide in him to abide in Christ to remain in him one mark of one who is a true child of the king is one who Seeks to keep the commandments. One who, when he fails, when she fails, which is every day, it's, it's bothersome to us. And we long to please him. We long to remain in his commandments. We long to remain in his love. We long to do what he asks of us. We long to obey him. We long to abide in His love, to remain in His love. We long to see Him one day. It's marks of a believer. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abided in His love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. True joy, true joy, true joy is being obedient to the commandments that the Lord God has given us as believers. True joy is resting in Him. True joy is resting in Christ. It's resting in His love. That's joy. The world has happiness. Happiness, it just comes and goes. It's, it's fleeting. The world's happiness comes and goes. It's fleeting. It's, it's, nothing, it's not built on it. It's, it's, it's basically built on circumstances. It's basically built on feelings. That's how the world experiences a supposed joy. That's how the world experiences a supposed happiness. 
is circumstances, feelings. They're fleeting. They come, they go. But Christ, with the Lord Jesus, with His disciples, He says, true joy, true joy is when you remain in Me. True joy is when you abide in Me. True joy is when you do My will. That's true joy. That's true peace. Comfort. And only a way that the Lord Jesus can word it. Only in that way. This is my commandment that you love one another, he says, just as I have loved you. He says, I, I long for you to love one another as, as I have loved you. Love each other well. By loving each other well, your joy will overflow because your love will be coming from me to each other. You have an overflowing joy is what he's saying. The joy will be overflowing. It will be resting in Christ. It will be coming from Christ. That's why it's so difficult to truly worship. And there's a problem with a brother or sister in Christ. That you might have with one another. What does he say? He says go to that person. Try to make it right. So your worship is not stifled. So your worship is not bothered. Make it right. Make it right with, with he or she. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, he says in verse 13. No greater love the ultimate example of that, we know, the ultimate example of that, as we looked at a little bit in the past, the ultimate example of that is the Lord Jesus Christ and what He done. It's the ultimate example. He set the example of what true love is. As he laid down his life, as he freely gave up himself for all those who believe in him. He turns to his disciples and he says, Listen, so too are you to be willing to go to the ultimate end. In service for me. In service for me. Again, he gets, he, it, these, these are the lists. He's talking about following him. He's commanding them to follow him. He's commanding them to do what he wills for them to do. You are my friends. If you do I, what I command you, he says in verse 14. You're my friends. It's a privilege. It's a privilege, it's an honor, it's a joy. We are special people, those of us who are friends of the Lord God, the Redeemer of the world. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Like I said just a few minutes ago, a mark of a true believer is, is one of those who who, yes, they fall, they fail each and every day, but they long to do the things that the Lord commands of them to do. They long to please Him. They long to make Him pleased. They long for Him to be pleased with them. He's teaching the disciples these things. Remember, they are quickly going to be out, what, on their own, if you will. 
They're quickly going to be out on their own. They needed to understand what it was to love one another. They needed to understand what it was to serve one another. They needed to understand what it is and what it was to, to follow the commands of their Savior, the Lord Jesus. They needed to understand this. They needed to understand what true joy was because they're about to be put out into the world. Sure, comforter is going to be given to them. The Spirit of God. But their flesh would remain. It would remain in them. Longing to do what the flesh desires. And not what Christ desires. He says, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things that I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. The Lord Jesus says, what my Father has told me, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm preparing you to do my will. I'm preparing you to set out and do the things I've called you to do. Listen again what he says. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all things that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. I've made so much known to you. I've held nothing back. It's as if he's no doubt preparing them. Preparing them. Now listen to what he says in verse 16. In his preparing them, he reminds them, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Wow. Wow. He just completely crushes human, human effort. The Lord Jesus just completely crushes human effort. He looks to them and he says, remember this. You did not choose me. But I chose you. You weren't looking for me. I come looking for you. I chose you. Just as he's done, everyone before these men that were chosen for this task, chosen for salvation, before them, after them, When the rubber meets the road, if you will, it's Christ that ultimately chooses whom he chooses to do with what as he pleases, salvation or whatever it may be. Uh, time to time you go back to the example of the Apostle Paul. He wasn't looking for Christ. Was he? He wasn't. None of these men were looking for Christ. When you come to faith, you are not looking for Christ. It was only after He drew you that you started even looking, and that was only because He drew you to Himself. It was it. Very difficult for the mind to get around. And especially in our day and time where we're so battered and filled with the free will of man and just literally choked on it. 
But we see here, he looks to his disciples and he says, you never chose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. In other words, not only did I choose you, but I appointed you. I appointed you. I appointed you. He literally crushes, if there's any sense of spiritual pride in any of them, that verse 16 just completely knocks it right out. This completely eliminates it. If there's any spiritual pride that one of them could jump up and say, well, you know, I, 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 I made this decision and here I am. And Lord, you should be pleased with me. That's gone. That's gone. It was my sovereign choice over you. Just, as, just like he chose Israel, just like he chose his elected angels. Just, I mean, it, it's, it's his will to do what he pleases. And so whatever way he pleases to do it in. I pointed you that you would bear fruit. Go and bear fruit. That your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He may give you. He says, now listen. Not only have I chose you, but I, it's, go and bear fruit. Go and bear spiritual fruit. Go and do that. The choosing of the Lord Jesus Christ, His will into a person's life. The evidence of that is when he or she bears fruit. There's something there. The parable to soils. Some seed falls on hard ground and there's no response at all. Others falls on rocky soil, somewhat of a response. Some falls on shallow, somewhat of a response, and then it falls away. And never really nothing there. But then there was that that fell on good soil. And it bare fruit. Now the level of fruit, okay, it different. Some bear much fruit, some barely bring in a basket full. But there's some fruit there. He says, go and bear fruit. Go and do what I've called you to do. This is of no merit of their own. He said, this is of me. This is of me. Not of you. Not of anyone but myself. Me alone. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 through 6. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with the spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Because we are united with Christ even before he made the world. God loved us. God chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do and to give him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. There it is. 
We praise God for the glorious grace He's poured out on us. Those of us who belong to His what? His Son. There's not one mention of man's own merit there. There's not one mention of man's own doing. But what is mentioned over and over and over again in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6, is the choosing the will, the grace of the Lord God. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And I will not lose what? One of them. One of them. We've got so many different movements in the church today and it's been like that for a long time. Belief systems and but you clearly see a simple study of God's Word, a simple line upon line study of Scripture opens up so much to who He is, to who we are. Listen, according to what we just read, we are nothing without Him. Our joy only overflows because of what He has done. Our joy is only complete because of what He has done. Makes that point clear in Scripture. That whatever you do, whatever capabilities you have spiritually speaking, spiritually good, it's not because there's something innate in you. There's not because there's something special in you. No, humanly speaking, no. It's because of what I've given to you, the Spirit of the Lord God, and enabled you to do. So it basically goes back to Christ and who He is. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit that the Father will give you whatever you ask and use for my name. This is my command, love each other. This is where it gets really sticky. This is where it gets really strange. This is where it gets really goofy. The end of verse 16. Whatever you ask, be given to you in my name. This is where people just get really crazy and stupid in their thinking, their understanding. Makes no sense sometimes how people think when it comes to this verse. And I ask for the most craziest things and say, I'm asking in the Lord's name, He's He's got to give it. Well, it turns into taking the Lord's name in vain Yeah. to, to do things like that. Uh, I've heard many preachers throughout the years, they just, they really emphasize that in Jesus' name, they it's not because they're having reference for the name of Christ. It's not because they're asking. They're just using it as a tagline. And that is the very definition yeah. of taking the Lord's name in vain. It's just to, whatever they say, uh, I, I really like a, a cheeseburger today. In Jesus' name, Lord, I hope I, I get some pizza tomorrow. In Jesus' name. You know, it's just, it's a blasphemous tagline that people throw on the end of a prayer or a motto, and it, it's sinful. Yeah, exactly right. And It's picked up here, as Justin said, it's picked up here and, and used in so many different, so many different ways. Not choose me, but I chose you, pointed you that you would go and bear fruit and you would fruit will remain. So whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give you. It's picked up 
and there and a few other spots in Scripture, I'm sure. And used in such silly ways. Such silly ways. Now what the Lord Jesus was telling the disciples was this. When I'm gone and I send you out to do my will, you will go out and you will do my will. And you will only be able to do my will because of what I have enabled you to do. It's a spiritual reference to the power of the Lord Jesus through a human, a human being. When Peter makes mention, get up in the name of Jesus or something of that nature, that, that's, a, that's a spiritual statement. That's a, that's a statement of all power that comes from Christ. and Not something si silly like as Justin said, well, I'm going to pray for a new car in the name of Jesus or a new house or a new wife because the one I've got is half crazy. I don't know. Whatever people come up with in their mind. But no, he's referencing to the fact that they're going to go out into this world. They're going to suffer greatly for the cause of Christ. But this will be a beautiful thing in service for him. He says this in verse 17. This is my commandment. Love one another. Love one another. He's telling them, this I command you to love one another. When you go out and you do serve me, when you go out and you're serving me, learn to love one another. Service for the Lord Jesus Christ is hindered dramatically when there's division amongst those of Christ. It's hindered dramatically. The Lord obviously knew that. When there's problems with Christians that sit in the same pews or go to the same church or whatever and around each other much, those problems only breed more problems. And it needs to be dealt with, spiritually speaking, immediately. For it to be put behind so that you can move forward for Christ. I've said it before and never really understood problems with other believers, the family of God, until I got behind the pulpit. Dear heavens. It doesn't take much to upset people of the faith. I figured that out. He's telling them to love one another. He chose them. They didn't choose him. He's commanding them to love one another, to have a love for one another in their service for him, the beauty of Christ. It's interesting that he picks up in verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, huh? You just got done talking about love for one another. Yeah, he's saying, listen, you're going to have to have love for one another because you're going out into this world and this world is, is filled with wolves. 
and you are sheep. I guess you can look at it this way. I don't know. You, you're going to have enough hatred coming at you from amongst those in the world. Please, you, you don't need to be in divisiveness towards one another within the church. Right? You're going to have enough problems coming at you from those that live within the world. This is a guarantee. They're going to hate you. They're going to despise you. And as you see the world, as you see the world system, as you see the world in which we live, the nation in which we live, that, that is just rapidly moving towards this, towards this hatred of Christianity in, in such a level in our own nation. There's always been this sort of facade, this, this love of Christianity in our, in our nation, but to the last 20, 25 years, it's really... It's really took a nosedive and they're taking off the mask, if you will, and showing some of their hatred more open. And Unlike other nations where they flat out just, you know, they didn't like us. They weren't afraid to say that. They've always said that. America's always had this sort of face mask on, this mask of liking one another and Listen, he's telling these disciples, he's saying, listen, the, the world's going to hate you. I don't like you. You speak out against it, they're not going to like you. There's many things you can speak out against in society in which you live, and the minute you speak out against it, there's going to be a hatred towards you. I, mean, I just watched a little bit of the coronation there a couple of days ago, whenever, and uh, yesterday, and I mean, one of the things that, that really caught my eye was this was this union of other religions coming around and and giving five or six different religions an opportunity to to pray over Charles and I'm, I'm telling you right now, you make a statement against that and and you're going to be in for a world of hurt in due time because it's going to come. I mean, they're not going to tolerate that. He made the statement several years ago, he's supposed to be the head of the Church of England, the Anglican Church, or Episcopalians mm -hmm. if you see him in this country. And he made the statement several years ago, he said, well, hey, there's a big problem with the king being the head of the church. None, that aside, he's supposed to be the defender of the faith. And he said years ago he would be the defender of faith. Not the faith, monster, flying, you know, faith in Buddha, whatever, because he was going to be this ecumenical yeah. leader. Well, his command as king is to be the defender of the faith, yeah. Christianity, the one true religion. Yeah, yeah. And here you are, and this is, this is where you're at now with it, and it's... Uh, this is where we are as, as a society and, and the hatred towards Christianity. And, but, you know, this is where the Lord Jesus is, like you said, where he's telling them in, in verse 18 of John 15, he's, he's saying, listen, the world's going to hate you. It's going to hate everything about you. But remember, it hated me first. It hated me first. So he just got done talking about, like I said, his love for them, their love for one another, their love back to him. But he's emphasized his love, their love for one another in John chapter 15, but it's it's just it's such a dramatic shift from, from 17 to 18. From this love for each other that to uh, the world's going to hate you. It's going to hate you. It's going to despise you. Everything yeah, about you. this whole section, you know, love, uh, I can't count how many times the word love is used there. And it's, it's as a commandment. And I've heard preachers say before, you know, they'll say, oh, 
Love your fellow man. That is the gospel. Well, I don't know what the gospel is, because if it's about me loving my fellow man, then I'm doomed. It's about God's love for me, unmerited love that he has for me, that he says, I have called you friends, and that he says that I chose you, not because of anything that, I, not because I loved him. I've heard many Christians say, I never hated God, I always loved God, even before I was Christian, I loved God. No, you didn't, you hated him with your guts, you just made a... Uh, a false God that you could love that was okay with your sin. Yeah. And, and that's been, you know, so much of cultural Christianity. Everybody loves that generic God that's not really the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly right. But praise God that He loved us, that He chose us, that He called us friends. And that's what He's saying there in John 15. I chose you. I called you my friend. My command to you is to love one another in the same way that I loved you. And I'm loving you in the same way my Father loved me. He said, All this was in preparation. All this was in preparation for sending them out for sending them out into the world. All the time he was with them was prepping them to send them into the world that hates them, hated him. And what greater, what better teacher than Christ, Jesus himself, as he prepared the disciples and reminds them, the world hates you, in verse 18, it also hated me. Do not be shocked. Do not be shocked. We'll stop right there and take a few minutes as we get ready for service this morning. So we'll pick up about verse 18 next week. And John, as we continue to move on through the Gospel of John and our study. Amen.